board work session. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mr. Bertoff? Here. Ms. Crawford? Here. Mr. DiBenedetto? Here. Ms. Tubin? Here. Mr. Wallace? And Dr. Pierce is on. Here. Okay, moving right along to uh, the public comment portion of our meeting. At this time, the board will, will hear public comments from speakers who signed up prior to the meeting. Uh, just a reminder that speakers shall be allocated three minutes each. And are we doing the online timer that we usually do? Aaron, I, I can do it on my phone if you like. Okay, thank you, Madam uh, Clerk. And please state your name and your address before, um, before starting your public comment. Uh, I have a list here, and the first name I have is Blake Copenhaver. You guys are laughing at me. <laughs> you I know. What's it going to tear? Hi, my name is Blake Copenhaver, and I'm 30 freshman at Emerson High School. Uniformly mandated dress codes are seldom uniformly enforced, often discriminating against women and marginalized groups. Girls in school are frequently dress coded for too short, short skirts and dresses too thin, tank top straps, and other clothing considered distracting. This then sends a message that a boy's education can be endangered by my gender and that I must hide it. We asked several boys if girls' clothing distracted them and they all said no. We asked several boys, oh wait, sorry. WPS dress code states the short skirts and dresses of an appropriate length and that meets or exceeds the mid thigh with no midriff or navel shown. But what is enforced is fingertip length, which is not what the dress code says. The dress code further states that sleeveless tops that cover the top of the armpit for both male and female students. Yet three fingers width is what is enforced. Again, not what the dress code says. Females are also dress coded for shreds and holes in jeans, which is also not addressed in the dress code. In some case, cases, teachers have walked into classrooms and will say, girls, stand up and put your arms down. And then any offending females are sent to the office. This is not only embarrassing, but it's distracting and takes away away educational time for all students, especially for the students sent to the office and possibly missing the entire class. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Haber. Next up, we have Caitlin. Um, my name is Caitlin Pinchona, and it's from Jerry South Washington Street. It is embarrassing to be dress coded. You are singled out in front of the class to have clothing inspected and possibly sent to the office. Public embarrassment is not okay. The inconsistent enforcement of the dress code is more distracting and disruptive to the educational process than the clothing itself. 48% of the WPS student population is female. Yet a far higher percentage of students dress coded are female. This is a direct violation of Title IX. Track uniforms, cheerleading uniforms, volleyball uniforms, and even socks and shorts are worn at school functions and in some cases to school on game days. If these were not considered uniforms or servants, would not meet the dress code. Every female sport utilizes clothing that does not meet the dress code during the school day. Why is it okay for those outfits to be worn on the school ground on school sponsored events and functions? But a female wearing something similar to school would have her education interrupted and face center reaction. Day references to being written up or receiving ISR are threatened. It doesn't if students are gaining leave from class and in some cases removed from school. And there are no incident reports filed and no reports provided to the student or parent. As seems to be required in the WPS policies. Section J students titled Teacher Teachers Removal of Students from Class, Code A F C A Part 1A B and C Part 2 A and C. We are asking that you or school board review the leave statement and be agile and phrase this and equitable and lead the way to address the inconsistent bias and discriminatory dress code. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Strona. Next up is Eva Dong. So, um, I didn't write it like that. I put it on my phone. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Say your address. Um, Eva Dong, 2317 Stone Ridge Road. Um, today I'm talking about like, dress code, and I think that dress code is unreasonable. And I have, so, and I have a couple reasons to share today. Personally, I think that people should have their freedom 
of clothing, you know, not right. I think I think by now boys boys of rose wouldn't be attracted by exposure of someone's shoulders, legs, kneecaps, cap, uh, kneecaps, waist, um, and thighs, collarbone, and etc. I don't see I don't see what is so attractive about a body part. I know that I know that the school system is trying to protect us and all, but taking us to ISR is no way to treat someone to cover up. It'll just make the girl act re re rebellious because it's not teaching the person to cover up. It's just saying, hey, hey, you have hurt. The boys will get distracted. <coughs> Next up, we have Mike Turner. First, thank you for having us. Mike Petrona, 600 South Washington Street. So as an HR professional, it's my responsibility to ensure that the company's policies are clear and consistent across business units. Winchester Public Schools has a similar obligation. However, the, dress, the public dress code as established by the school board is not published correctly in two of the seven WPS student parent handbooks. This is an issue. What is published in WPS dress code is incorrectly enforced in several schools. There is nothing in the dress code that indicates short uh, skirts, dresses, and must be finger lips yet, or finger, finger, fingertip length. There is uh, nothing in the dress code that states uh, sleeveless tops must have straps of, of a certain length. There is nothing in the dress code that indicates the holes in our rips and jeans must be below a certain point. Yet students, the majority female, are singled out in the classroom, have their education interrupted, and being disciplined or removed from the classroom for these perceived infractions. This is also an issue. There are educators that are known to students, some who don't attend an educator school, for being strict regardless regarding the dress code. Knowing and knowing for enforcing their interpretation of dress code and not following policy. Uh, students, mostly females, have expressed anxiety over going to school because of the dress code. Several have reported being told their educators that they should buy boy shorts and short to ensure they are in dress code. Uh, conversations that we never heard amongst groups of students that they don't ask questions in class anymore because they don't get the to draw for themselves. Uh, what kind of hostile or toxic environment have we created in our schools? This is also an issue. How much institutional time is being lost in power struggles? How many hours, how many hours being lost? <coughs> how much anxiety and stress is being created? The incorrect enforcement of the public dress code and overzealous, and the enforcement seems to be disrupted, distracting and detrimental to the educational environment. For the current school year, past years, the question is, are data tracking homework students being coded for the reasons? The students' names are confidential, but there should be data that the public can see to track these types of statistics or work requested. Are teachers going through policy trainings? Um, so what corrective actions do I have or will take place to ensure a consistent learning experience with the dress code policy? As elected officials, the school board owes it to our students and to our educators to address immediate clear change. The inconsistency with the dress code is an issue. Addressing this issue quickly, providing clarity and consistency will keep the school system from facing potential lawsuits and aid for the violations of the students' constitutional rights. Thank you. Thank you. The family family. I'm Raina Katrona, also 600 South Washington Street. Um, the Winchester Public Dress Code Policy is unconstitutionally vague. To be constitutional, policy must give clear notice of what conduct is prohibited and must provide clear standards to the officials charged with enforcing that policy. The WPS policy does neither. It contains vague directives and prohibitions that depend on the administrator's personal tastes and opinions. For example, what's included in the dress code is any clothing that interferes with, disrupts, or has the potential to disrupt the educational environment is unacceptable. Any clothing or article or attire that exposes excessive skin any clothing deemed inappropriate for the educational setting by the administration. An administrator may punish a student for wearing an article of clothing that complies with every aspect of the dress code except that particular administrator's personal opinion of what clothing may disrupt the educational environment, exposes excessive skin, or is otherwise deemed inappropriate. A student may encounter several, several administrators throughout the school day without incident but be disciplined later in the day when he or she encounters a different administrator with a different opinion of that student's outfit. Students are subject to various progressive corrective actions for non-compliance. 
Students are pulled from their classes for perceived dress code violations and cut from their education until they obtain a change of clothes or agree to wear school provided clothing. These punishments are almost exclusively imposed on female students, while male students <coughs> are rarely addressed. The vagueness and arbitrary enforcement of this policy makes it unclear to female students what clothing is forbidden. Given the incorrect interpretation of the current dress code and other subjective parameters, female students are constantly at risk for discipline. The 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution prohibits a public school from engaging in this type of gender discrimination. The inequitable application of the dress code also likely violates Title IX. And if the dress code also disproportionately disciplines female students of color, the school may be, may be in violation of Title IV of the Civil Rights Act. Beyond the legal issues of the current dress code and flawed enforcement, the impact to our students is toxic and disruptive. Students are being humiliated in what should be a safe environment in the classroom, and their educational time is being disrupted. To paraphrase Golda Meyer, if female students' bodies are causing the other students to be disruptive, the school should punish the disruptive behavior, not stigmatize female students by using restrictive dress codes to shame them into hiding their bodies. It is beyond time to remedy these issues, and this board should consider the message being sent to our female students by telling them that their bodies, when clad in typical teen and preteen clothing, are distracting to their fellow students. It's 2022, and it's time to do it right. Thank you. <coughs> that concludes all the names that I have on my list. Is there anyone that arrived a little bit late who would like to address the board at this time? No way? Okay. And that moves us on to section three of uh, our agenda, the consent agenda. The approval of consent agenda items will include the agenda, minutes, and bills. Motion to approve the consent agenda is denied. Second. Okay, motion by Ms. Truman, second by Mr. Burchinoff. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, moving on to section four of our agenda, reports and presentations by, uh, by staff. We have first, uh, Ed Snow. Get early tonight. Right? <laughs> <coughs> I spilled water all over my notes, so forgive me if I make some mistakes. <laughs> or have to find something. Uh, so this evening, um, we thought it would be a good opportunity to start with this initial discussion about naming of the new um, CAO. Um, this December, the CAO uh, will move, uh, the administrative team will move into our new administrative building located at 598 North Kent Street. Uh, the site of this new building is the former Douglas High School, <clears throat> which was also previously named the Douglas Community Learning Center. Um, before we open the building to full operations, uh, we need to discuss the possibility of renaming that building to something that reflects both its use and its historical uh, significance. Unfortunately, this is a topic that I don't know, I don't have a lot of history of that. Um, we do know that uh, 598 North Kent Street started as the Douglas School, um, <clears throat> but it's been through several iterations um, over the years that it's been open. Since 1927, it's been uh, things such as an intermediate school, a temporary elementary school, I think a couple of times, uh, an alternative education location, um, and finally, its final home to uh, it was Head Start, uh, Pre-K Schooling, um, and the Boys and Girls Club. So it's had a whole lot of uses over the years, um, and I'm not I'm unsure of the names of the, of, the, of the building at those times, whether or not it was still considered the Douglas School, or whether it was the Douglas Community Learning Center, or if there were other names in between that. I, I just don't have the history on that. But, um, but we do know that there were signs uh, that, that labeled it as the Douglas Community Learning Center. It's located on Google Maps, that, that way it was listed on the maps. So it was updated um, throughout the years with a name of some sort. And so policy FFA stipulates that the school board determines the names of its buildings. Okay? Um, and so uh, at buildings including schools and facilities. And, um, and that you are also allowed to create a committee if need be to make recommendations to the board. You can also, as a school board, accept recommendations from public entity, thank you, a public entity um, or a, pro a public group, as long as they provide you with their recommendations and their reasons for those recommendations. So initially to discuss that, we wanted to uh, kick around some thoughts, uh, get the board uh, generating some, letting us know what direction they want to head. 
Um, internally, we've been referring to the building as the Douglas School, the historic Douglas School, the Douglas School, um, the future CAO, a couple of things, right? Uh, but we do know that the two primary uses of that building are going to be one, uh, a meeting house, a public meeting house, um, uh, a, a place where we can have conferences, we can have, we will have school board meetings there, uh, we will have conference space, uh, we will open it up to community groups. Um, but at the same time, attached to that building is our administrative offices. And so, um, so really our job, our, our, that building is going to uh, hold two specific uh, duties to the community, one to the community and one to the administrative team as their offices. Um, so one of the things that we've discussed this morning was naming it, uh, you know, along the lines of uh, the Douglas Meeting House, um, the uh, Douglas Meeting House at the WPS CAO or WPS Central Administrative Office. It's very long names, long um, drawn out names. Uh, sort of like the, you have the Patsy Klein Theater at John Hanley High School, you know, so there's there's uh, internal workings of that building that we want to recognize. But one of the things that we really want to recognize is the Douglas name. Uh, at some point, we all uh, shorten the names of buildings. You know, Virginia Avenue, for instance, is actually Virginia <clears throat> Avenue Charlotte to Hart. It's now commonly referred to as Virginia Avenue or Backdale's, right? Corals is the same way. It's Garland Corals Elementary School, but we ended up calling it Corals, right? Um, and so we, we tend to, to pull, shorten things, just the human nature of it all. Um, but we would like to um, understand and keep that Douglas name going forward as we can uh, to recognize the historical significance of that building. And so um, just some thoughts. Those are just some thoughts that, uh, that we had as we talked about it in the cabinet this morning as well as some discussions that I've had with uh, Jason and stuff. So um, I'd be glad to move in the direction that the board wants, but I just wanted to open it up to a conversation, see if the board had any thoughts, see if there was a direction you wanted us to head. But in the end, we do need to be able to label that building in some form or fashion that reflects both its use and its historical nature. So, any thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Smith. Yeah. Well, okay. I was just thinking in terms of the school board at the Douglas, just having Douglas in there in some capacity, but saying that it is the length of the school board at Douglas. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we were talking about, you know, if we wanted to have it the mm -hmm. Douglas Meeting House or the Douglas School at CAO or Winchester Public Schools Central Administrative Offices, or if we just wanted to call it the Douglas School. There will be, it will have its own address. I mean, the two buildings will not have their own, their individual addresses. Whenever we receive a package or somebody mails something to us, it will be mailed to the administrative offices. It will not be mailed to the Douglas uh, Meeting House, right? Um, that building, the 1927 section, the old section is now officially, formally a meeting house. It's, it's going to be available for meetings and trains and any type of groups of folks that we need to get together, it'll be a space available for that. So, um, I'm not asking you to solve the problem today or anything. I just really wanted to generate some conversation, um, have some thoughts about it, and um, and go from there. We can always come back to you again in a month, give you some time to think about it. I can talk to our the alumni group as well um, and see what their thoughts are. In fact, I plan to do that. Um, I can bring that information back to you as well. But again, just wanted to open the floor and open the door to conversations about that building. We are going to be moving in, in you know, in the next four months or so. Mm -hmm. Do you need to have anything before you get there? I don't know. I mean, we're um, we, 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 yeah, we would need to. I mean, mailing something to Winchester Public Schools would, would simply go to that address. Um, I don't know that we need a formal name mm -hmm. before then. Uh, you know, said that the thing I was thinking, I, you know, on the same day that I uh, landed this gig, I also got appointed to a, uh, a board uh, at my old college, and we have the James Monroe, uh, James Monroe Museum and Memorial Law Office. It's, it's a building on his old law office in Fredericksburg. You can have a very good color. You can have Oriole Park at Camden Yards, but it's still called Camden Yards. Right. I think the old Douglas School, the Douglas School name is 
tremendously important. Of course, we also have another Douglas School. So if you say, well, we're meeting at the we Douglas that. School, <laughs> yeah. um, people might go to the wrong one. Right. Calling it the old Douglas School makes it sound like uh, yeah, well, we have old John Kerr, we have, yeah. you know, so we're, we're not, it's not like we're not used to that. Uh, it, perhaps we do need to have uh, some sort of committee responsible for calling this, and it does need to include the uh, Alumni Association, which is a very uh, strong and passionate group, but I really like the idea, I like historical names, and, and uh, and making that connection that this that this isn't a new building, this isn't this is a repurposing of an old historian building. Right. And on behalf of the administration, I think they agree. The whole, uh, you know, uh, everybody that, that will work in that building in the future agrees that mm -hmm. that's it. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm supposed to really raise my hand. <laughs> you can recognize yourself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I agree with everything that Mr. Benedetto said. Uh, I, am I wrong in assuming it's named after Frederick Douglass? He never called it. Frederick. Well, that was a good controversy. Yeah. Is that one of them? Yeah. Oh, so what's mm -hmm. Douglass? Mm -hmm. is it well, we understand that. Yeah. I think historically it was that it was somebody after him, him, but they just didn't spell it right. Yeah. No, it was because in Loudoun County they already had a Douglass school, school, school right. and they did it to differentiate. Yeah, I understand it to be purposeful. They dropped the S mm -hmm. um, to be different. Yeah. But it was, it, but, it still was named after Frederick Douglass. Yeah. And his portrait used to hang in there. Mm -hmm. so, well, the part behind him is, has his portrait on the side. Yeah. It's named Frederick Douglass, part yeah. of the two S's. Well, I know they call <laughs> Frederick Douglass Elementary the Douglass School. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I, don't, I, I agree with Vince, and I, I think we wouldn't get too much confusion. Yeah. It's going to be the Douglas School and it'll be Frederick Douglass Elementary. Um, and I, I think we should definitely keep that name for history sake and for the meaning of that building as well. That's that's where I would call. Yes, it's true. Um, I agree with what everyone's said here. I I don't want to rush it, but I also think it's important that we open this building that has been a labor of love for everyone in the Almost everyone actually in this room, I know many that are here, many of the speak have been intimately involved in the, um, the renovation of, of that school and the preservation. Uh, and we've also, we've had many, many years to think about it. So I think it would be, if we could do it, unless we really felt like we didn't have the right idea, right. we should do it in cutting, knowing what the name of the, the, the building will be. I'm not opposed to a committee. I do wonder if that would slow us down, but I think public input is exceptionally important. So I wonder if there's a way we can still get that input, not only from the alumni association, but this community and the broader community around us um, and, and use that and then let um, Ed, you and your team and the administration bring back a recommendation or recommendations to this board in you know, 45 days, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, that gets us towards the end of October. I don't know if that's quite enough lead time for you all to order any signage and things of that nature. Maybe that comes in later, but I just can't imagine sitting there at a ribbon cutting with, with no name on a, a program um, for a, a building that's just so such an important part of our history. Right. And I think, I mean, it's really, you have the Winchester Public Schools. If you send a package to Ed Smith, you're going to address it to the Winchester Public Schools. With how are we going to refer to it and what comes first? Is it? Douglas, then Winchester Public Schools, or Winchester Public Schools, then, then Douglas. But I think if you go back to the alumni, which we're meeting with them frequently now, um, and then solicit any other public input, we can get you that recommendation. Yeah. yeah, I think it's going to end up being called the Douglas School, no matter what. Yeah. And I think that's what every, I mean, that's the bottom line that everything that's what you want. has to be in there. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. nobody refers to this as Winchester Public Schools. No, it's oh, yeah. 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 It's spelled right this time. Right. So that's a great question. I mean, I yeah. talked to the mm -hmm. alumni. I, my perception, Carmen, correct me if I'm wrong, is there there's a um, affinity for the way it has always been spelled, the one. And that was because of the diploma. Yeah. yeah. I think that was the whole. Yeah. I, I kind of like the uniqueness of it. If somebody made that decision one day, and I don't know, I kind of like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of conversation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it reminds yeah. people of Jason, what, what is who it on? <clears throat> What's the sign say in front of this building? This Central administrative. It doesn't say, what, what, we have the WPS logo, right? Yeah. 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 As 
phone that doesn't become the Pepsi Cola. <laughs> Hold on a minute. There's sponsorship involved. Yeah, Maybe we have some a rough sponsor back there. Yeah. Okay, then uh, then I will go out and start soliciting some thoughts on that, bring the bring that information, possibly from a small committee. Yeah, we can email our suggestions. If you have additional suggestions, please. Talk to somebody and you're like, wow, that sounds great. Is that the Ed, Ed Smith building that the Douglas? Yeah, the Ed Smith the Douglas. Yeah, yeah. Ed Smith building that the Douglas. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, this brings us to 4B on our agenda, policies for review. Um, this is, I don't have a name here. Dr. Bruce. Oh, hi. Um, good evening. Um, in our strategic plan under organization, for organizational empowerment, objective four, it states that we will review 100% of our policies um, in four years. So um, currently we're at 67% and we would like to continue to move that forward. So we have got a plan to do policy reviews at each board meeting, about 10 at a time, um, just so that you all can kind of get your eyes on some policies that we have. Of course, you know with um, any changes, those come as minors and, and major um, change policies. But tonight we've got um, just a few, 10 actually, for you all to just take a look at. Um, of course, as any changes come up, through VSBA, those are released, um, and then we'll, we'll make any changes as needed there. But for tonight, it's just these 10 for review. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. And um, we were given access to these policies for review a few days ago, last week, maybe even. Uh, I'm not sure if Marie received any comments no, or that you know of Jason. No? Okay. Um, so these are just for review. Does anybody have questions or concerns with these? I would just say in general, we get these ahead of time. I hope that everybody reviews them. You know, we don't have to line by line go through these. Yeah, that would be fine. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Hearing no uh, further discussion, we'll go ahead and move on to future action items. Minor policy revisions. So as I mentioned earlier, BSBA releases updates to policies every February and May, and sometimes sprinkles some in in August as well. Um, at this time, um, administrators review each policy. They determine whether or not it's a major change or a minor change. Um, tonight, we are bringing 28 policies to you. Um, all of them are minor changes. Um, most of the changes are minor edits, such as capitalization. Um, some of them are code changes or cross-reference changes. Um, so tonight, these are brought to you for information and as future action items. Okay, so kind of same deal with this one in terms of the policy revisions. I'm not sure if Ms. Nima received any comments or questions. Are there any this evening? Hearing none, we will see these again next meeting at the yes. Yes. Okay. All right, 5B, major policy revision. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So I am bringing um, an updated policy KNAJ tonight, um, and the changes are a result of House Bill 4 and Senate Bill 36. And essentially, as I put in my memo, it is an existing policy, but there have been updates specifically to the section if you go to report to law enforcement officials. Um, that part has been dissected a little bit. The assault and battery part has been removed um, because previously um, it had that uh, when there was no injury that school administrators may report. So that part has been taken out and the uh, most notable addition is on the second page of my memo and it states that uh, a principal is not required but may report to the local law enforcement agency any incident involving any written threats against school personnel while on a school bus on school property or at a school sponsored activity committed by a student who has a disability so the most noted uh, changes is that any written threats is included in that bulletin section and then they have autonomy 
to either report or not report incidents involving a student with a disability. Great. Thank you, Ms. Buckley. You're welcome. Comments, questions, concerns? The, the, I know it's not your language. This is not a question about your writing style. But it feels extremely specific. Um, any written threats against school while on a school bus. So I, I literally have to write the threat while I'm on school property or a school bus. If I'm, if I'm home on my Chromebook and I write the same threat, but it's on WPS email account, that wouldn't fall under the purview here, even if I'm a student with a disability. So it would have to be, well, the school official would have to determine. I mean, you can act upon the disruption to the school day, even if it's not on the school campus, but specifically the way this one is written, and let me reread it for a second. Um, well, on a school bus, on school property, or at a school-sponsored event. I mean, technically, a Chromebook would be school property, is how I would perceive that. So, I mean, if they were to use a school Asset. device, Okay. We could impose discipline as a result. It's just it's my interpretation. Right. Well, of that. I think there's a difference right between the the discipline versus reporting to local mm -hmm. law enforcement. And this just seems like such a narrow um, piece where we're giving the principal autonomy to not report it. And so I don't know if there was something specific that drove this or if I'm just reading this wrong, okay. but it feels very strange. I think might, this might be a result of the situation in Loudoun County last year, and it just is saying you don't have the right not to inform on this. So the Chromebook and all that, things that happen at home, that's still, that can still be a crime and it can still be reported. It's just saying that in these circumstances it must be. That's the way I, I read this. I'm reading it the opposite. They don't have to. They have discretion. Only, only with disability. With Correct. Disability. Correct. In other words, if they don't consider this as something that they Think that the disability had something to do with why they made the threat as a but yeah. on all the others you have to report so we would look at a student's eligibility in terms of what mm -hmm. to identify disability to determine if there is um, any relation to that mm -hmm. in regards yeah. to whether we would report it or not it just seems odd like it's just written but i can say the same thing out loud and i don't mm -hmm. have discretion so um, <clears throat> This is intended to protect students, students with disabilities, disabilities yeah. so that the discretion falls on the administrator to understand the child's IEP, their cognitive ability, and really kind of make a judgment call, mm -hmm. quite frankly, of whether this particular student with a disability should be turned over to law enforcement mm -hmm. or not. Yeah. Um, and that's a, a, that is a, uh, that's a discretion you've always had, I think, because so now it's turned around saying, Here's where you don't have discretion, but it's making it clear that you right. still have discretion on that. Because I, I think prior we had discretion even on everything. On yes. Everything. Right. Yeah. Now I understand you must do it here, but we'll have this covered out for student display. It still doesn't answer, Eric, your specific question. Yeah, I'm just really poking on why just written and why yeah. only in these specific scenarios because I just like they just stop that threat. You know, yeah. Right. Could be a verbal threat. Right. It could be, yeah. We'll get some clarification mm -hmm. for you. Any other comments or concerns? Thank you, Ms. Buckley. Thank you. Okay, good old policy EFB <clears throat> food service. Um, it's an all encompassing policy that covers several major, major tenants of the federally funded school uh, food, food service operation. Our last major review is simply in February um, as we completed and wrapped up that policy. But House Bill uh, 2135 um, of the 2021 General Assembly session required that as of this year, July 1st, 2022, that all schools that have economically disadvantaged percentage of 50% or greater, that the school district is required to apply for the Child and Adult Care Food Program. And what this program does is it provides meals to, to students after school that are in those schools with 50% or greater free and reduced um, to feed them when they are uh, participating in an after school education and enrichment program. 
Okay, that is the, that is the, the law. The law changes that we are required to apply for this program and provide the meals to the students. The VDOE has told us that this is not for after school sports. It's not for after school clubs. Um, it's not for kids that stay after school to work on a project together as a group. It is um, an after school specific education and enrichment program. So what we're looking at right now is we see this affecting us um, significantly during SLO remediation classes after school um, or for the twilight school that they have in order to help kids get their grades up. And so um, this modification to the policy will simply bring the board's policy uh, into line with the law, with the requirement. Um, so we are in the process of working through um, the logistics of setting up that program once we get it into policy. Right now, we've asked, uh, Lori's asked her managers to reach out with the principals and work with them on any uh, significant programming that they may have uh, for educational um, assistance or enrichment. And so uh, we will continue to, to refine that definition of what the program is. If we have questions, we'll call DOE and ask them to make a ruling on it. But uh, but again, the program is required by law, by, by Virginia state law, according to House Bill 2130. Um, the second change uh, to the policy is a result of House Bill 583 of this year's General Assembly. Um, and this ch change simply further, it clarifies, it further clarifies that the school board will, and, and employees of the school board will not withhold extracurricular activities from any child, child that carries a balance on their school nutrition account. Um, we already practice this as part of our procedures anyway. We also do not carry debt now because we are on the uh, CEP, the Community Eligibility Program. So we don't have anybody charging meals, so we don't have any debt on the books for any of our students. Um, so this is not something we would concern ourselves with, but it does bring us, aligns the policy with law. So, um, so really, again, these are just to bring, the reason we brought it to the board is because it is a major change uh, to uh, our, our procedures for feeding kids after school. Uh, and that we, and just to make sure that the board understands that we will be implementing that program um, according to the card. Yeah, I think it's required. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments? I was going to say, so we have, to, <clears throat> I mean, we have to do it, right? So, yeah. But um, does this incur extra costs to pay our cafeteria employees? So uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, uh, what, we're good, what we're probably going to do is do grab again. So okay. we'll put together a meal of, uh, that is uh, eligible for re reimbursement, and then we will prepare those meals, and then we'll probably provide it to the instructor or to the teacher that holds those classes or those, or those program, runs those programs after school. Um, and hopefully it will, it will not require an additional cafeteria employee. Um, however, food costs will be offset by the reimbursements that we put that are, we receive from, uh, from the federal program. Excellent. Yeah. Mr. Have, have they provided a definition of what constitutes enrichment? They have not. No, they have. I mean, that's, the, I just pulled I'm that just straight like, you know, we have chess club, you have Lego club, this. Right. They told us it was not for clubs. They said okay. that it was, it was for instructional purposes. And I guess enrichment is really more like the SO remediation, mm -hmm. I guess. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. But we have, I know you're saying they told us, but we have that document somewhere. I just don't want it to come back, you know, in a year from now to say, well, yeah, I'll check. It was enrichment. I'll check with I'll check with Lori. Yeah, we'll follow up with the state on just about anything that sure. that's going to be significant. Um, yeah, we'll we'll follow up with it. But I don't I don't I don't know what they define. They haven't established some sort of yes or no on these different things. They told us to reach out to them if we have questions because I guess every school district has so many different programs right. with all these different names, and they just need to take them on a one case by case basis and understand what that program does. <clears throat> yeah. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. I, okay. if, I, if memory serves correctly, uh, pre-COVID, so this is going back years, I remember hearing that board meeting that several churches in the area <clears throat> we cover cover the debt that has been incurred. So, so yes, we've received uh, payments from churches in the past to, uh, to cover students. So they so there's been like uh, I know that we've received a, a significant contribution from a church that actually called Coral Elementary and said how much debt is on the books and Lori pulled it up and gave it to them and they wrote a check for all of it. Yeah. So that, that, that occasionally happens. They do not haven't covered the entire district. In fact, there's been several years the board has, 
has paid that out of operating money to re recover those debts because we're not allowed to carry them. Um, but churches do, and even even uh, um, individuals do. It varies from year to year. It does. It's okay. completely uh, random. We don't happen. go out and see it. Sure, sure. Yeah. But when it does happen, do we publicly acknowledge and talk to the other people that as a board? I don't. That's a good question. I don't recall whether or not we've yeah, done anything. Okay. Yeah, like when a church does it. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and for the foreseeable future, I can't imagine. Now that we're in the CEP, I don't see that being an issue. Right. As long as that, that program that continues to go, then yeah. uh, we will we will continue to use it. Like it yeah. As far as we know, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Did we see it again? I think so. Uh, uh, track. Hanley Track. Okay, the Hanley Track. Okay, so uh, John Hanley High School has a Mondo branded track that's been in place since 2008 when the Hanley renovation was completed. That means that the track is 14 years old, entering its 15th year in service. Uh, general lifespan of those tracks are anywhere between 10 and 14 years. Um, so the Hanley track has pretty much has reached the end of its life cycle. Um, it, it is, it's, uh, it's in bad condition. Um, I can tell you just from personally walking it, from talking with Michael Kiernan, the track coach, from talking with Reed, I brought Reed in, asked him to come if there's any questions y'all might have. But, but it is in bad shape and does need to be fixed before it becomes completely unsafe, quite, quite frankly. And so, um, so we have reached out to various um, track companies uh, to talk to them about installation. We've asked, uh, we talked to uh, the current track that we do have is a Mondo track. And so we were looking to see what it would cost to replace the Mondo track. We've, we were provided this proposal that's in your uh, board packet um, that provides you with three uh, uh, options, one of them being the Mondo track, uh, and then two of them being a polyurethane uh, track. And um, I'll just talk very briefly about um, the differences between them. The Mondo is uh, is a top of the line, uh, quite frankly, an Olympic cal caliber track. Okay, faster speeds, easier on athletes' legs, um, the highest quality you can get pretty much in the world. Um, their tracks are at, at uh, Olympic stadiums. Um, and so it's, uh, they're, they're high quality, um, they have easier maintenance, uh, you can actually cut out a piece of it, replace it, and it's fixed. Um, and uh, the warranty on it is a 10-year warranty with a lifespan in the neighborhood. They think that now that they've improved it, it could be between 15 and 20 years if that track could last now. Of course, we're at 14 years on the old one, but with uh, changes to it, they believe that it's a 15 to 20-year track. Polyurethane tracks um, are more common. Um, they are uh, your typical high school track. Um, there are two ways to do it. One is what's called a sandwich method and one's called a full four. Just some slight variations to the way they install them. But in, in essence, they basically mix rubber and polyurethane and they, they coat uh, the track with it. Uh, they coat a, a, an asphalt base with, uh, with that material. Um, they, uh, the, the sandwich system is the most common track for high schools. Um, the pricing is lower, much lower, and it meets it generally meets the, the uh, standard needs for a track. Um, it is more difficult to maintain, um, and it uh, you have to recoat it whenever you, you have to recoat the entire thing. And whereas with Mondo, like I said, you can do sections and that kind of stuff. The warranty on it is much less, five years, and um, the life cycle uh, the life cycle is expected much less, probably in the 12 to 14 year range. Um, and that's for both the full four and the uh, and the uh, sandwich system. The price difference is uh, can be is significant. The you know the sandwich system is the least expensive, um, costing in, in the neighborhood of half a million dollars, a little more than half a million dollars, whereas the Mondo track will cost you right at a million dollars for the track only. Um, no matter what track we do, there is uh, an expense to uh, pulling up the old track, uh, milling the asphalt that's underneath it. Once you get past a decade or so, that asphalt needs to be um, ground down, the top uh, inch or so taken off, and then replaced with a new fresh um, um, asphalt. And so no matter what track we choose, we're going to have to do that. That's a couple hundred thousand dollars on the price of the track, uh, so that you would add that to the, to the cost. And so uh, you're looking at the least expensive track is going to cost you in the neighborhood of $750,000, and the most expensive track, the Mondo, is going to cost you about $1.2 million. 
Um, the timeline on, imp on putting in the track, we, uh, we, we, we talked through various scenarios. We could start work you know, after football season, but then we would have to leave it because temperatures have to be a certain degree in order to get things poured or get things installed. Um, things have to cure for, for uh, you know, 30 days. Uh, the asphalt that goes underneath it has to cure for up to four weeks before they can lay the track down. And so, um, so really the best way that we see this happening is in um, immediately following uh, graduation. Uh, we feel like that's the best timing, starting it after graduation and then it running through the summer. Um, I talked to Reed and we would plan uh, our first few football games as away games, just to give us a cushion in case something did happen with the track not being complete because it will be a construction site and it, would, and it will be closed during the time that we replace the track which if we'd start the day after graduation means for the entire summer of 2023, we try to be closed to the public as well as to our students and, um, and teams and stuff. So <clears throat> we do not anticipate running any track on it next year, simply because again, it is deteriorated to the point where we really would just rather run somewhere else, quite frankly. And so our plan is to not run track meets on it in the spring of next year. Um, so I think would, that's everything. Yeah. What are the options three? Oh, options. Well, there's 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 three options. One is the Mondo, and then two two different polyurethane tracks. One of oh, uh, well, is a sandwich well, system, and one's a full core. Yeah. Um, the the difference between the sand the sandwiches they mix everything together and then they just pour it all out in one coat, whereas the full core is they, they full pour and then they full pour another layer and then they full full pour another. Layer. So it's it's just a different way of doing things. They either pour it on thick or they pour it on thin and, and, and recut it and stuff. So those are the two major differences in the polyurethane. So um, the, uh, the desire uh, is, to, is to have a Mondo track, quite frankly. It's uh, the one we currently have. It's uh, you know, the Hanley, I'm part of the Hanley campus. Um, you get good colors out of it, obviously. It matches the school and stuff. And so there's, there's uh, um, and the track coach would prefer it, quite frankly. <laughs> and so, uh, I think that's everything. Did I miss anything? <clears throat> no. If you were to do it in the spring, get you locked in the price now? Well, that's why it's that's why it's before you now, so that by the end of the month we can get it done. Um, we the, this quote is provide, was provided in July. We've been through some back and forth. Plus, I want to do my homework with other. Uh, track companies, um, and so um, this, if we approve this by the end of the month, the price would be locked in for Mongo. Um, polyurethane is probably not going to change significantly if we were to go in that direction. Um, so this would lock it in, it would get us on their calendar, and we would be set to start again the first day, first day available after uh, after I get some Talk about the funding for it and what we, uh, what else we, what we might not be spending money on then if we go the more expensive route. I'm not against it. No, 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 I know. Yeah. So the difference in pricing is what a half a million dollars, roughly four hundred fifty thousand or so, between the polyurethane and the new Mondo track. That would be the money that we would be giving up. Right? This is all carryover. This and it would be funded via carryover. Yeah. I have money set. We have money in our accounts that aside from that. Um, so four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, I could rattle off a whole bunch of things I could spend four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for. But but nothing critical. What's that? Nothing that would cause a critical problem with something else right now. Uh yeah. nothing's critical. Right the CIP you have you know we have some chiller rebuilds that are on coming online. Yeah. Um, of course the, the major construction of HVAC is Going to be paid for with the CARES Act money and the remainder at Virginia Avenue and Corals will have to be bonded or financed by the city because those are both eight million dollar projects so CARES Four is not going to touch it um, but um, you know we do have some other HVAC like chiller rebuilds at the high school I think a couple yeah, of years that's yeah, middle school um, and has a big list there's no doubt about it and you I think your 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 choice point here for me is um, you know, having the campus of Hanley is a blessing and a curse, and this is the one where it is a 
it is a jewel. It is, um, we have a reputation. Um, it's the first thing you see. Um, we currently have a Mondo track. Um, we've always had that first class atmosphere in the bowl. Um, and um, I just can't imagine not doing it, you know. But it does cost, no doubt about it. So it's the only one company that does the Mondo? There's only one that does the Mondo. I, so I called four or three. I called three other four to open, and the other three said we don't we don't do Mondo. Um, in fact, one of them that I called referred me to this company. <laughs> they said this is the company that does Mondo in the Mid Atlantic region, and so um, so I, I don't I guess they're, they're the ones that did the original. They did the original Mondo track, course. and so um, so they're the, they're the they, I guess they have you know control over the entire Mid Atlantic region. So. <clears throat> I recall when we went to replace the turf and we were debating the options there that we were talking about the warranty and hopefully I'm remembering this correctly, but I'm pretty confident it was shared that it doesn't matter how much usage it endures, it's not going to actually impact the life cycle of the turf. As we talk through things like, hey, do we need to cut off public access? Are we going to go from a 10-year lifespan to a 7 because we know we have people out there all the time? Does the track, do these types of tracks, the Mondo and the, the Sandwich and the 444, do they operate similarly? That, you know, doesn't matter if we have one meet a month or 30 meets a month, it should last us 15 to 20 years. I know the warranty is only 10, but I just was wondering about that. Um, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Because I just, I watch what goes on there, and I know, we're, you know, it's an open place, it's it wonderful. Is. But there's bikes, and there's skateboards, right. and there's rollerblades, and, you know, if we're going to make an additional half million dollars investment that is going to take away from other investments in our school buildings, and that impact just as many kids, if not more, than, than the track, I, I think we need to dovetail that with really you know, open conversations about how do we do all we can to preserve the life of that track. And because I can justify half a million dollars if we're going to get another five to ten years out of it. That's a mm -hmm. no-brainer to me. Right. Just a simple ROI. But if we're going to have people on there with with bikes and razor scooters and everything in between, it's get torn up. I'm not sure it's still, if we're going to get there. I think if you ask the you know, yeah, say one thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm yes, totally yes, close. I apologize. I apologize for my tire. We're football game going on. Trying to run down and run back. Um, I would say your, your answer would be accurate if you're talking about the first, the, the other two options. If it, Mondo is is the most is the option that will last the longest the, uh, throughout all of the usage because of how it's laid down, and we also have the ability to replace a single lane if we need to. So if there is a spot that is worn down, more run down, wherever. You could do it individually, kind of a plug and play situation, as opposed to if you're talking about four. Well, the, the, when, when you look at that that fab, not the fabric, but if you look at the, what the materials are, like if they're little like rubber granules that you get at every other track or every other high school. So those are going to slowly pick apart and pick off. So the extra usage, it, it, it's ironic because if we went the cheaper options, then we probably should lock the bowl because it will deteriorate the track quicker. If we go to the Mondo option, I think we could leave it open as, as is, if that for makes any sense. 15 to 20 years. What's that? We still get the 15 to 20 years. I would, yeah, I firmly believe that. I mean, I, mean, I can't promise that. I mean, who knows? We'll know it's a year. Yeah, I'll go see Justice Side, it will be good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but, but I do think the technology of the product right now uh, will, will last longer than the current product that we have. Mm -hmm. So if we got 14 out of that, we're going to get a longer product because the technology is important. Is that fair to say, Coach Kiernan? Yes, and most schools, that, um, universities, and schools that go with the Mondo track will put up multiple, excuse me, multiple signs asking people not to bring wheels on the track mm -hmm. and to stay in lanes five through eight. And my daughter can mm -hmm. tell you, a few years ago, I would stop in a few nights a week during the summer and tell people you're not allowed to have wheels here. And I'm willing to do that again. <laughs> well, that, she, in fact, she accused me of protecting her like a 
it's not made. <laughs> and in some ways, it is. That, that's a great point. And I remember when we were talking about the turf, about keeping pets off of it, yeah. was one of the things that we talked about. <laughs> and we went back and forth. Well, then you got to pay somebody to go down there. Who's going to go down there and be that person that kicks the people off? I think now that we have a PIO, that might be a great use of time and social media well, just to no not so just well, them actually maybe she's probably shaking them yeah, that's right. not what i was thinking i was actually thinking of like just just intermittent reminders yes, yes, yes. you know uh to the community that it's open to the public uh what you know what we pay for by the way so yeah. so use uh i like the idea of using just certain names i hadn't heard that before yeah, yeah. and not to bring roller blades and Whatever else uh, on the track as well. I'll say, I mean, we've been talking about this. We, we, we've seen the train coming for a year and a half now, I think. And it's not the first time the track cost has come up and the price tag has been within range of the high end the whole time we've been talking about it. So it's not a surprise. And I don't think we want to, can't use that word, but tap, you know what, this project. Um, I think it's a worthy gear staple. Yeah. I kind of, I may interject one more thing. I don't, hopefully, I'm not speaking too out of turn. But a poor track, when it gets wet, is much slicker than a Mondo track. So, for fun or practice and meet, I know it's not a big deal to others, but there is a difference for hurdlers and jumpers between a poor track and a Mondo track. It might be helpful if we had like on I know we'll take action at a future meeting, but I think for, for the public and kind of our historical context state, if we took each of the costs, the options, and then you know we had a columns of here's like the life cycle. So here's really what our, our annual cost is yeah, per have, year. I, I think that nice. would be helpful to <clears throat> kind of have documented um, since it's in here, I'm sure, with the ten to fifteen years, but it, it's hard to find. No, no, I have, a, I have a spreadsheet. <coughs> it's it's provided by the vendor. I'm sure. So <laughs> I'm sure. I know which one they would like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, so it's something I would I would have to. I'll do a little more research on it, make sure that it's accurate. But it does show the Mondo track being in, over the long haul being an equivalent cost to uh, to the year track. Again, because you do have to recoat the entire track. So I can bring that back as part of my part of the recommendation in. Uh, in a couple of weeks. I assume cleats and spikes are detrimental to yeah, the track. And what you and what what we would do is all meet. We would do what's pretty common with people who do a Mondo track, which is you've got to check your spikes in. And what that means is you have to take your racing shoes over them before you race, and an official looks at them. And if they're longer than a quarter inch, or if they're anything other than a pyramid, which may not mean anything to most people. If there's anything other than a pyramid or longer than a quarter inch, you cannot race. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. And I was actually thinking more of soccer cleats and football cleats because what that track does is effectively create an island out of the field. And to access the field, you have to walk on the track. Has anyone, and I don't need anyone in this room, but like has a company thought of some I'm sure way yes, to, yes. We've actually done things like that in the past. Where we had I don't know what you call it, like a yeah, carpet, carpet, carpet. 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 But then they went across and had the teams to cross mm -hmm. using that. Okay. And I would that might be something to look into doing that again. Okay. We have Miss Braithwaite here. She actually requested a bank that would cost another half a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do it guys. Really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And her and her sister oh, yeah, were having cool. memories. Something in the house or something. Let's do it now. Yeah. 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 Any, any other comments or questions for just now? Thank you. Okay, this brings us to action item 6A, VSBA regional nomination. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. So, um, this is something that we've already discussed and uh, prepped 
I mean, I'm not sure we've discussed it with the board. We oh, discussed well, it in, right. in the two back two. The two I'm happy to provide Sorry. context. <clears throat> uh, I'll let you take it. Okay. Yeah. About, uh, I think a month ago, BSBA reached out and, and asked if Marie would consider serving as the chair um, of the regional BSBA contingent. Um, and so she uh, agreed to do that, but she needs the full endorsement of the board to be to represent um, you. So. Um, that's uh, that's what this is about. It's uh, an honor to be uh, asked by BSBA as, as the city of Winchester. It's region um, region four, I believe, is, is the region. Are they align to four Valley region. Valley region. That's right. All the regions are. It's like a big Venn diagram. Like how the VDOE constructs a region, or they're all different. So uh, the Valley region. So it does require an action. Um, the reason it's on today is they would like to make this official as soon as possible. So. Motion to approve the nomination of Marie Mo as vice chairman of BSBA Valley Region. Second. Okay, we have a nomination by Mr. Burchinoff and a second by Mr. DiBenedetto. Any comments? Discussion? Hearing none, all those approved? Aye. Aye. Anyone not in favor? Okay. All right, section 6B now. Um, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the board, good evening. Hard to believe it was just under a year ago, October. In October, we were notified and awarded the teacher and school leader incentive grant by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, came to you in November of that year and made you aware of that grant and, and all of the initiatives it contained. It's called the Redesign the Educator Pathways. Connecting the HR the REACH grant. Um, and in December of last year, uh, the board approved um, categorizing opportunity culture as the uh, sole provider, sole source for uh, assistance in that. And we approved the first year's budget uh, for that assistance through the grant. We're coming to you tonight, uh, and I've given you last year's memo as, as background information on all of that. As we now go into the second year of the grant, we're called fiscal year for um, federal grants is uh, October to September. So we're going to the second year and just asking the board to uh, look at that again because the amount of it requires board of approval. The good news is the second year is at the level of 175, 100 instead of the 274 for last year. So as we move into the second year of the grant, we're asking for your review and approval for us to uh, go ahead and um, you know, thank you for the year two. Uh, mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay. Um, Chair, what are you doing? Motion to approve public impact contract awarded under the DSL <coughs> grant in the amount of $175,100. Okay. okay. Motion made by Ms. Truman, seconded by Ms. Crawford. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. All right, this evening we are in need of closed session. Pursuant right, yeah. to section 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia motion that the board convene in closed session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters, including prospective candidates for employment and assignment, employment, promotion, performance, promotion, salary, discipline, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees, specifically substitute teachers and support staff roster, club and activity site and contract, and administrative site and contract. Second. Motion by Mr. Burchinoff, second by Ms. Truman. Motion to approve public impact contract award in the amount of 175,100 